Fox fans. Are you ready? You are listening to the Ducks and Pucks podcast with your hosts, Mike Walters and Eddie Jones. This is the number one home for Anaheim Ducks talk and analysis. Here we go. Welcome to the show. This is your host, Mike Walters, along with my co-host, Eddie Jones. And we're going to get you caught up. We had a week off. We had a little bit of scheduling conflict, but we're going to catch you up on all the Ducks action. We're going to talk about the trade they made with Patrick Eves. Uh, we're going to get to all the NHL action with the trade deadline. Obviously, uh, it's coming up this week, but a lot of moves have been made already. So we're going to talk about those. And we're going to talk about all the questions you guys have. We've got some interesting ones to get to as well. So we're going to do those later in the show. But first... Let's go back. The Ducks were on the road trip. They finished up the road trip in Minnesota, Eddie, and they played Boost Brujo and they beat him finally one nothing. Yeah, and it was really thanks to to Gibson almost in this game. I, I mean, it was a it was a goalie battle, and Gibson won out in this one. You know, the Ducks only had twenty three shots, and Gibby had a thirty seven save shutout. So, you know, credit to him in this game and. Uh, the Ducks were kind of up against it in this one. Then. They didn't even have one power play opportunity. There's a little bit of controversy in this game. Uh, the, the Wild had five. Uh, no penalty minutes whatsoever for the Wild in this game, which was a little bit weird. Uh, something you, you don't really see too often, but I guess we, we see more often than not with the Ducks. But, I mean, a, a good battle for them in this game, uh, You know, not having the power play opportunities, being able to, to grind out. Uh, a tight win, and, you know, with the Wild this season, um, every game that we play against them is a tight game, and, and you know, the Ducks are going to have to win these games if they're going to go far in the playoffs, and it was a, a big win for them. Yeah, I mean, finally, you know, the Ducks had lost the uh, the couple games before uh, against Minnesota. Uh, they lost in the faceoff circle in this one. Like you said, in the power plays, the Ducks didn't even have one power play in this game, which, I'm sorry, that was a joke. Uh, if you watch the game, you saw what happened. There was some stuff going on in there where the Ducks should have had some power plays. Joseph uh, Camarosa came up with a goal in there. The Ducks won. So it, was, it wasn't it was the greatest uh, road trip. You know, The Ducks only won two games out of the six, but at least they came out with the win uh, on the final game of this trip, Eddie. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it was a tough trip for the Ducks, and then obviously they go into the next few games after this, but... It, it's good to get a win, and, and arguably one of the toughest games of the trip, playing you know the best team in the Western Conference, playing your former coach and, and whatnot, and playing in Minnesota, it's always a tough game. So for them to come out and fight and battle and, and get the win like that, I think it was really good for them. And, and the bigger story in this game was Antoine Vermette. You know, he uh, hit the ref uh, with his stick after the puck uh, was dropped. Uh, obviously, some of the calls went against the Ducks. Uh, he felt that some of the faceoffs were unfair. Uh, during the game, uh, I saw the video uh, on, along the ice. It didn't look like Vermette even hit the ref. Then somebody else posted a, a, a GIF or a video, and it was uh, like an aerial view, and you can tell he hit the ref. So what ended up happening is Vermette got suspended 10 games for the quote-unquote abuse of an official. It was reviewed later on uh, after these last couple games, and it was upheld Um I don't really agree with it, Eddie. I, I mean, I get it. I look at the rule. I get it. There's category one. There's category two. There's category three. You look at it. He falls in the middle there. It's the 10-game suspension. I get it. Um, you shouldn't hit a ref. You shouldn't t- touch him, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I just still thought it was a weak call. But it, it's unfortunate because it's going to hurt the Ducks here. Uh, you know, obviously in these next five games and then, um, you know, five more after this uh, this podcast. Yeah, it, it's disappointing. I, I mean, he's been big for the Ducks in the face-off dot, and, and to to lose him over something so silly. I, I mean, I get it. Like you said, it's a rule. It's in the rule book. You can't hit an official. I understand it, and I understand why. You know, the officials and the and the union would want to upheld this and and keep the ten game suspension. I mean, you you can't have this happening. It, it's obvious, but it's disappointing. I mean, especially for the Ducks to lose a a key player like for Matt. Um, you know, they've got guys who can fill in. Obviously, Kessler is great in the faceoff dot. Getzloff can step up at times. Raquel's been playing center. Uh, but when you lose the number one faceoff guy in the league, it's it's going to hurt you at some point. So, um, you know, hopefully we can just get him back as soon as possible, put him in the lineup, and, and we'll be good to go. But it's for, for the next five games, like you said, it, it's going to be a big loss for the Ducks. And then after this game, you know, the Ducks finally return home. 
they uh, play the Florida Panthers. And this was a disappointing game, Eddie. I really expected the Ducks to play better in this game. You know, it was 0-0 off their first period. Uh, Cogliano scored uh, early in the second shorthanded, which we all know how great he plays uh, on the penalty kill. The Ducks had the 1-0 lead. But then Florida got three goals in a row. Uh, the ageless wonder, Yager, scored one. Ekblad scored one. Next thing you knew, it was you know 3-1 at the end of the second period. The Ducks ended up going on losing this one 4-1 to one at home, Eddie. Uh, you know, they had more shots on goal. They dominated the faceoffs. Um, really a game that I, I thought the Ducks would win. But, you know, that after the Cognano goal, they just seemed to fall apart in this game. Yeah, it was a disappointing end to that second period, which really cost them the game. I mean, it was six minutes where they just didn't play good hockey. You know, Cognano, like you said, he got the shorthanded goal. And then from there on, you know, they got dominated in a shift by, by uh, Florida's fourth line where uh, Colton Skeever eventually scored the goal. Um, and that's disappointing. I mean, they had a better match about in the ice and they got dominated by the other team's fourth line. And that's one you want to prevent, especially when it's the game tying goal, um, a turnover in front of the net leads to a goal for Yammer Yager. And then from there on the, the Ekblad gets the power play goal for them. And all of a sudden they're up three to one. And it's a pretty tough lead to come back from, especially with how well Reimer's played against the ducks in the last two games that the ducks have played the Panthers. So it's disappointing. I think they deserved a little bit more from this game. You know they they played really well. They uh, in with you know in the faceoff dot they were seventy three percent. They dominated there. They had thirty six shots. Uh, they just couldn't get it going in this game. And, and like uh, we've said so many times this season, you know there was a six minute period where they just kind of stopped playing at the intensity level that they were playing at. They kind of relaxed after the Cogliano goal, and it hurt them. And they ended up losing the game because of it. Yeah, like you said, I mean, there's been times this season where the Ducks have played certain games and they haven't played poorly, but then there's a five, six minute stretch and that ends up doing them in. And that's what happened in this game. And, you know, with this, then they, they had to go, uh, you know, play the Kings the next game at home. Uh, but the Ducks rebounded in this one. You know, they didn't win the faceoff battle, but they shut down the Kings in this game. Uh, Gibson earned the shutout. Manson got a goal, and that's all the Ducks needed in this one, Eddie. The, the Ducks rebound after the poor game in Florida, and they beat L.A. one nothing in this contest. Yeah, and, and another big game for Gibson against the Kings. It's his second shutout against the Kings this season. Uh, similar uh, to the game against Minnesota where the Ducks didn't have too many chances. They, they did outshoot L.A., and they played a pretty good defensive game in this one. Only two power plays didn't uh, uh, get anything going on those, uh, a physical game. Um, but you know, another one where they've shown that they can play well defensively, um, here and there, I, I guess, obviously the game before that against the Panthers, they broke down, but they're seeming to do it more consistently, or at least on a regular basis now where they're being able to limit teams chances. And then the odd game like this, the one against Florida, and we'll talk about the, the, the second game against the Kings, but they also lost four to one where they just break down at times, but uh, as for this game, where they're able to to pull out one nothing, this is the type of Ducks team that we're used to seeing. We saw it against Minnesota. We've seen it in this game where you know they're able to play tight game, play well defensively, capitalize on on the few chances that they're able to get, and, and end up winning the game either through goaltending and, and quality defensive play. And and it's obviously not the most exciting hockey to watch. <laughs> uh, it's more nerve wracking than anything that they you know they have to scrape out a one nothing win. Um, but it means they're doing something, right? And the defense is playing well. Gibson is, is playing out of his mind. He's been the best goalie since January 1st. So, uh, I mean, if the Ducks get a little bit more goal scoring, they'd be okay. But, you know, I think in this game, especially when it's a four-point game and it's against a team that's climbing up in the standings and, and trying to catch the Ducks, I think it was a, a huge two points for them. Yeah, and you talk about that too. I mean, as far as the Ducks, you know, they got the two points. As you said, it's a four-point game, which that is huge in and of itself in this game. And the Ducks, uh, you know, they got the one goal, but like you mentioned, you know, they they won two of these last three games, won nothing, but they're only scoring one goal a game. I mean, they're they're not getting it done. You know, they're not scoring enough. And uh, when the Ducks uh, beat the Kings, they then went on the road the day after against Arizona. Uh, Bernier started in net because it was the back-to-back -back scenario and the Ducks had a terrible first period against Arizona. You know, they gave up three goals in the first period. They pulled out Bernier. They put in Gibson. They rallied back in this game. They got a goal in the second. They got a goal in the third. Botnan almost tied it up at the buzzer at the end of this game. 
Um, but a little bit of frustration here. I mean, this game, I mean, after the Ducks played so, you know, defensively tight in that game against the Kings for 60 minutes, uh, they didn't play great defense in that first period. I mean, I know some people were on Bernier's case, but it wasn't all his fault. The defense wasn't there in the first period. Gibson comes in, all of a sudden they play better. And uh, I really thought the Ducks could have at least got a point in this game. I mean, despite the poor first period, they played a lot better after those first 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah, they did. And, you know, another aspect of, of their game that we've mentioned so many times this season, I already mentioned it once in this podcast, and now again, <laughs> that there are some times where they come out slow, and, you know, I you can't blame everything on Bernier. He didn't have a rocky start. Um, and just poor defensive play. And, and the first period was just a mess for them. And they dug themselves a hole that they can't get their way out of. They can't score. They're not a, a good enough team offensively to dig them out of these three goal deficits that they put themselves in. And, and you know they they tried. And you got to give them credit for trying. At least they tried in this game. They got close. You know they they scored with 27 seconds left. Fontenot hits the post like you said within the dying seconds, and they're just not able to scrape it out. But this is a situation they can't put themselves in. And whether that means. You know, Murray goes out and gets a four that can help them, or some guys have to step up. Uh, you know, I.E. Perry has to step up and, and and get some goals and help this team out. But uh, I mean, it, it's it's something, it's a situation they can't put themselves in. And you know, they've played really good games where they're able to scrape out a one nothing, two one win, and where we praise them for playing well defensively. But when either the goaltending isn't there or the defense isn't there, if they get themselves in a hole, they they can't dig themselves out of it. Uh, it it just, just seems to be the case on too many occasions. Yeah, I mean, and the, and the roller coaster continues. They they beat Minnesota, you know. They they beat the Kings. They they dropped this game to Arizona. Then they play Boston at home, and and this is a wild one. I mean, Boston scores first, and then it goes back and forth in the second period. After the second period, the Ducks are up three to two. You got Casse, Raquel, and Manson scoring. Uh, Char scores in that period. The Ducks are holding on there. Uh, Boston battles back. They tie the game up, but Raquel gets his team leading 24th goal. Uh, then Cogliano gets his uh, you know empty net goal, which was uh, credited to him after he was tripped. And I mean, this is a wild game. I mean, just completely crazy game. Boston had a goal disallowed in this game, and I know they were crying about that. Uh, Bernier had to go in net because they they said that Gibson was injured. Um, which a little bit of an update on that. It looks like uh, Gibson has a strain. Uh, it looks like you know they put him on the ER. Uh, we don't know for sure if he's going to play on Friday against the Blues coming up this week after the trade deadline. But it's not a long term thing. Thank God. Um, you know they did some tests and everything. It, it looks like they just wanted to rest him, so they rest him in this game, and obviously they rest him in this next game against LA. But this was a crazy game, Eddie. I mean, I was glad the Ducks pulled it out, but I mean, you know, it wasn't like all these other games where they were they were you know closer games. This one was a wild one with the Ducks, you know, pulling this one out uh, and getting five goals in this game. Yeah, it was a, it was a back and forth game. I mean, a real tight first period where where the Bruins were able to scrape out a goal and take the lead, and then I, after that, it was a crazy second period where the Ducks end up scoring three goals and take the lead, and then Frankie Vitrano ties the game in the third period, and the Ducks are able to, to uh, get a win late with Raquel getting the, the go-ahead goal, and then obviously Cogliano uh, getting tripped and, and getting awarded the empty net goal. I, I mean, a crazy game. Um, it's good to see that the Ducks, you know, they were able to get a lot of depth scoring in this game. Cache scored. Uh, Raquel had two uh, when him and Perry had a pretty good game. Cogliano got the empty netter goal. Um, and then uh, Manson got the goal when he was out there with uh, Richie and Cassier. So, uh, I mean, it was a good game for them. Um, it's disappointing that, that Gibson didn't get to play in this game, obviously didn't get to play in the, in the Kings game because of a day-to-day -day injury. I think it was good on them to recognize that they had the five-day break and to put him on the shelf and make sure he's 100% healthy coming back because we're obviously going to need him if we're going to make a push in the playoffs. So I think it was a good gutsy win by the Ducks in this one. Um, and finally, you know, the goal scoring comes through and they're able to score five goals. Yeah, I mean, that was the key in this one. The Ducks scored a lot of goals. Finally, you know, a lot of the games, they weren't scoring one or two goals. And then, you know, after this, we get the news that the Ducks made a trade. So the Ducks trade a uh, second-round pick, 2017, uh, conditional pick for Patrick Eves, and they get him. He actually plays in this next game against L.A., the, the second one that we're talking about in this, this podcast. And uh, the conditional pick 
is uh, contingent on the Ducks making it to the Western Conference Final, and Eves has to play in 50% or more of the games in the first two rounds. So, you know, you get that move, Eddie. I mean, they make the draft pick for Eves. Uh, you know, he's got 21 goals, uh, you know, just over half of them on the power play. You think it's a good move. Um, you know, it adds some offense to the Ducks. He actually played pretty well in the beginning of this Kings game. Uh, you know, obviously, the Ducks lost this one. The Ducks started out one nothing and actually uh, really controlled the play in this game for the first, first uh, excuse me, 40 minutes and then blew it in the third period. But what did you think about this trade and how he played in the Kings game? I, I still thought it was a good move on part of the Ducks. Yeah, I, I think it was a good move. I, I mean, the conditional pick for right now, and unless obviously the conditions are met, it's the, the pick that uh, we got in the deal uh, for Freddie Anderson from Toronto, and that's the pick that's going back um, to to uh, Dallas. So it depends on where Toronto finishes. If they make the playoffs, it's obviously a lower pick. If they miss the playoffs, it's a higher pick. Uh, and then obviously the conditions on it being possibly a first-round pick, depending on how far they go and how many games they play. I, I think it's a good deal. I think it addresses the Ducks' need. Patrick Gibbs is more of a goal scorer than he is a playmaker. You know, he's not a light the lamp kind of goal scorer on every night, but he's had a pretty good season. You know, he has 11 power play goals when with the Stars. It's the Ducks' power play has been struggling, so it makes sense to bring in a guy like this. And I think getting him for only a second round pick. When I've looked at some of the the prices for some players, like Victor Stahlberg went for a third round pick today. Um, the price that Martin Hansel went for, guys like, like <laughs> Alex Burrows and other guys exactly. that, that went around the same thing. I think it's a decent price. For yeah. a guy who's had a pretty good season in Dallas, who's put up 21 goals, uh, I mean, obviously he doesn't do it season after season, but I think it's a good uh, acquisition for the Ducks in this game. You know, he had five shots on goal um, in, in the game against the Kings. I think he played a pretty solid game. He drew a couple penalties. He played just over 16 minutes. Uh, he played a bit on the power play. I, I think I think it was a quality addition for them. I don't think it's the only thing. Like, I, I think if they do this, they're, they're set. I don't think that, I mean, they have to add another forward and I preferably an actual top six forward. Um, but I think these are the type of pieces that you add. You see the Blackhawks add a type of piece like this every season where it ends up being a, a big addition for them in the playoffs. And I think he can make a difference if the ducks are going to go deep. Um, but I don't think it's the main thing. Like if the, by making this trade that they're, they're set now. No, and I, I totally agree. And we're going to talk about some of these other trades that went on with some of the other teams. We're obviously going to talk about the Ducks and, and, and what they haven't done since getting Patrick Eves. Obviously, they haven't made any moves yet at the time of this broadcast. I mean, obviously, we're on, we're on Tuesday night here, but you know, the eve of the, uh, the trade deadline. But I, I agree with you. I think the Ducks need to do more. And, you know, this game was an interesting game. I, I really thought after the first two periods, the Ducks were going to win this one. They were up one nothing. Uh, then they just blew it in the third period. You know, Toffoli gets an early goal, makes it one to one, not a big deal. But then he comes back, he scores another one four minutes later. Brown gets one, you know, uh, 17 seconds after that, and then it was just over after that. And I just think it was frustrating. I think the Ducks uh, played a, a good game. Obviously, Bernier started in this one again because uh, Gibson's out with that strain, as we talked about. Uh, Jonathan Quick came back for the first time in this game, which we're going to talk a little bit about that later because obviously there's a trade with L.A. and uh, Tampa Bay that affects that, so we're going to go into that. But I really thought the Ducks had this game, Eddie. Uh, they looked good. It looked like it might have been another one nothing game, but you know, like we, you and I talked about before, they had that five minutes in the third period where they gave it three goals, and that did them in in this one. Yeah, they just ended up looking tired um, in the, the end of the third period there or looking like um... – before the Christmas break, you know, the game that they played there, we're like, okay, these guys look like they're ready to go into the break. It almost seemed the same thing here. They're getting close to the end of the game, knowing they've got five days off here, and it just seemed like they were, they just quit, and they were ready to get it done, and they slacked off a bit, and, you know, they got scored on three times in, in a five-minute period, and, and it cost them the game. And we've seen it so often this season that I mean it's almost like the second period thing that we saw last season we didn't know how to explain it it just happens um you know it's just something that the Ducks have to be able they have to fix if they want to go far you can't do this in the playoffs I mean it's a regular season game okay it's not that big of a deal but if you blow a one nothing lead in, in the third period and and you know you get scored on three times in five minutes you know in in, in a playoff game that's going to come back to hurt you that's a, a loss in a seven game series and you know they can't do that if they want 
to advance to, to the Stanley Cup final and ultimately win the Stanley Cup. It's just something they can't do, and I don't know how they fix that. Obviously, getting a, another goal scorer isn't really going to help fix that. I think it's just a mentality for the players. Um, they can't quit. You know, this is a team that we've seen so often come back. You know, in, in the last few years, been able to come back from being down. They've been able to fight back uh, when losing. You know, they they're a team that doesn't quit. And this season, they've kind of lost that a bit. And, and at times in games, we've seen it multiple times. You know, they they just can't get it going, and they get behind, and and the other team can convert on their chances. So if they're gonna go far, they're gonna have to figure out a way to get away from from this style of play. Yeah, I agree with you 100%, Eddie, that we've seen different games this year, whether it was Pittsburgh, Columbus, this last game against the Kings, uh, Nashville. We had different games where, you know, the Ducks played great for 55 minutes, and then they played poorly for five or six minutes, and they, and they end up shooting themselves in the foot. So very frustrating in this game, uh, you know, for the Ducks to play so well and then, and then to blow it there in the beginning of the third period. You know, another thing about this that I wanted to talk about, too, was the social media aspect of this game. I thought it was interesting. The uh, the Kings uh, social media in this one, you know, tweeted out, down goes El Capitan uh, when Gessoff got knocked out. And then I thought it was funny because the Ducks social media tweeted out when Kessler knocked out Carter, you know, good night Carter in one punch. And then I thought it was interesting. All these people got upset over the Ducks, who the Ducks social media, as you know, is a lot more mellower than the Kings. And they actually decided to post something against the Kings, and everybody jumped on them. And you know what? I, I think it's a bunch of BS, honestly. I, that kind of pissed me off after this game. I was honestly, Eddie, more upset that the Ducks, uh, not just that they lost, but I, it really pissed me off that people out there in social media were mad that the Ducks were posting a fight clip and Kessler knocking out Carter. The Kings do this stuff all the time. Bailey does it all the time on his account. And for them to go off the Ducks social media like that, I thought it was very frustrating. Then the Ducks actually deleted the tweet, which even infuriated me even more because the Ducks actually fought back. Obviously, if you look at ours, we posted the gif of Carter getting knocked out. And I just, I just, I'm sorry. I'm going off a little bit of a tangent here, but I, I don't like that. I, it pisses me off. And that's why we defend the Ducks. We defend the fans and everything. And I, I just don't like the fact that. The Kings social media does their certain thing. Don't get me wrong. That's what they do. The Ducks take a, a, a little bit of a higher road, and then we're somewhere in the middle, basically. And I just thought that was frustrating that some of the people went after the Ducks. I think that wasn't really fair. I think that uh, you know Brady and AJ and them, they do a, a pretty good job with the Ducks. And I just don't. I just didn't think that was fair. And for them to delete it was even more frustrating. I, I, that's just my, my take on that. And that's why we posted a lot of the videos afterwards. And... That's just how we are, and that's how we're going to roll here. We cover the stuff, whether it's on Twitter or Facebook. We post the videos and whatnot. And, you know, if, if you have a problem with that, then I, I, don't watch hockey. That's my personal view. And there's some people out there on social media that, for some reason, they chose to target the Ducks organization. And, and yeah, I am going on a tangent right now, but I just don't, I just don't agree with it, Eddie. I, I think that, you know what, if the Kings want to post stuff and then the Ducks want to post stuff, all is fair in love and war. And I think, you know, it's just good fun. And that's what hockey is meant to be. I mean, the Kings did beat the Ducks. They deservedly won the game and got the two points. But if you want to go back and forth and joke around, then both teams should be able to do it. Yeah, and there's a lot of teams in the NHL and, and, and their social media accounts, specifically Twitter is what we're talking about here, that do worse or that do similar style of things. I didn't think it was bad. I mean, it was all it's all in good fun. You know, he didn't get hurt. I, I don't see the issue with them saying, you know, good night, Carter, or whatever. And... and posting a gif of the fight i mean it's a fight i, I we see it all the time in hockey i mean the the coyotes did it on their twitter when domi one punched kessler exactly uh, i mean it happens and it's part of the game you know it's a highlight in the game i don't see the issue with being a little bit of a homer i mean you are that team's social media account I, I mean, <laughs> exactly that is your job so I, yeah i am disappointed in the fact that they they took it down i don't think they they had to they kind of caved to the pressure which okay i understand that you want to kind of cool things down and that's been the style of the duck social media for as long as we we know but uh, i mean it is disappointing I, I think they should be entitled to do whatever they want as long as it's tasteful i don't think there was anything wrong with them doing this you know the, the you look at the the columbus blue jackets social media and even the pittsburgh penguins i mean they're they do whatever they want especially the columbus blue jackets they do exactly. pretty much whatever they want and they're pretty cool with it, and they don't really care 
what kind of backlash they get us. And, and they've never done anything where it's been offensive. Uh, I mean, and this was by no means offensive. So I, I don't no. see why so many people got angry about it. I think the majority of them were probably Kings fans, and it just snowballed from there. And, and you know, if if the Ducks, their social media, they wanted to take it down just to cool things down, I understand that. But I don't think it was that big of an, an issue that people had to take it that far. Yeah, exactly, Eddie. I I don't get why people were so upset about it. I mean, if you're that upset about the Ducks posting that, then you should be upset about the Kings posting the stuff. I, I you know, whatever. I mean, that's just the way it went. But anyways, the Ducks ended up losing that game. Unfortunately, they're now in the bye week. They have uh, you know, the five six days off. We have the trade deadline coming up. The Ducks already made the move to get Patrick Eves, which Eddie alluded to. We both agree that it is not enough. Um, that's one of the fan questions we had is, you know, what are our thoughts on the Patrick Eves trade? Do we think it will help the Ducks? I think Eddie and I are in agreement. We do think it will help the Ducks. But, Eddie, you and I talked about this. We don't think it's enough. No, and I mean, it. it is a great deal. I mean, he's not a, you know, impact player where, you know, we're excited to get him and he's going to make a huge difference. But he's only he's only carries a one million dollar cap rate. He's cheap. He, like I said, he has twenty one goals this season, eleven power play goals. He addresses a need for the Ducks, but by no means is he one going to keep up that production. We don't know if he will. I mean, he's playing on a very very good power play in Dallas. They've been struggling this season, but you know he's been playing on you know with Sagan, with Ben, with Spezza, with Klingberg. I, I mean, he's got his opportunities there. And uh, on a Ducks power play here, he's going to be relied upon a little bit more uh, to uh, make plays or, or, or finish on his chances because they're not going to get as many chances as uh, the Stars would on their power play. But I think for the price that we gave up, a conditional second, obviously if it goes to a first, if they win the Cup, I don't care. But <laughs> if it goes to a first-round pick and they ended up losing in the Western Conference Final or whatever, then it's a little bit disappointing. Uh, that's a tough price to play for a guy who's not going to be back with the team most likely next season. Um, but I, I think it's good for what it is right now. Like I said, it addresses a need. You know, he, if he if he scores a couple goals by the end of the season, can help out the power play, then sure, that's great. But like you said, it, it is it isn't enough, and, and the Ducks need to add an actual top six forward, specifically a left wing at least, uh, onto this team if they want to make a deep run in the playoffs. And, and speaking about forwards, we have you know Adam asks us a question about that too. He talks about Landeskog, uh, JVR. Uh, Evander Kane, uh, you know, and what the Ducks will do to maybe get one of those guys. Will they trade Votnin? Uh, what about Theodore, Montour? You know, basically, what do you, what do you think we're going to do? Uh, I talked about this a little bit earlier on Facebook. You know, landeskog has been a favorite of mine. Uh, you know, I know Tatar's name has come up. That's a favorite of yours, Eddie. Uh, and we've talked about Botnin too. I still think the Ducks need to move Botnin to get one of these type of players. I mean, if they're going to make the room, the cap space is so tight they're going to have to move someone out like that or, or someone similar with a 3 or $4 million cap space in order to get one of these types of forwards. Yeah, they're, they're going to have to move somebody to get a forward like that. And, and you still got to remember, we talked about this last week too, is you're going to lose Manson if you if you don't trade one of Vaughn and Fowler or Lindholm or trading Manson himself. And I agree that you don't have to do that right now. You can do that at the draft or before the expansion draft where you don't risk losing one of those guys. But, I, I mean, if the Ducks want to get better right now, then why not make that trade right now? And I understand it's a hard deal to make. Moving a guy like Sammy Votnin with his cap hit right now at the deadline is difficult, but there are players available out there. You know, there's still Tatar on the Red Wings. It, it is a difficult trade with their cap situation for sure. You know, there is Vander Kane. As much as we talked about how we didn't want him <laughs> last year, he's still out right. there. Um, yep. JVR is still an option. I, I don't know, you know, with Toronto getting Boyle and, and looking more so – like that they're they're going to prepare for a playoff run, then I don't think I really see them moving a guy like James or Riemsteig, but there is Pilat and Johnson in Tampa Bay, and they're, you know, they've made a couple deals so far. They're still looking to move out Valtteri Filipula, sorry, and they're looking for a top four defenseman as well. Still, Vatnin would fit perfectly in their system, and they might not be able to sign both Johnson and Pilat in this offseason. Hedman's extension kicks in for them. They also have to re-up Drouin on a new contract. Plot and, and uh, Johnson are both restricted free agents at the end of the season. So there's a lot of cap room that they have to make here. So maybe possibly them bringing in a guy with some term 
as a top four defenseman would help them in, in Sammy Vatna. So I, I think that maybe is the most likely option for them. Both teams don't really have to make a deal. It's more so if it's the right deal and if it works for them, then they'll make it. Um, one team who used to be in, I think, is out now are the New York Rangers. Is They were supposed to be in on Shattenkirk. They're more so leaning to be the favorites to get him in unrestricted free agency now. And they also made a trade with the Red Wings today, signing or uh, trading for Brendan Smith. So they look to be done in adding blue liners, especially if they think they can get Shattenkirk in the summer. So, you know, those are the, some of the options, I think. But, you know, Murray could always come out and surprise us and trade for a forward that we didn't even know was available. So there's, it's going to be an exciting and stressful day tomorrow. And I really, really hope that they can make some kind of move to uh, to improve the, the top six forward group. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. And, you know, uh, Alexander asked kind of about that too. He's like, what players did the Ducks trade for? What big name player? And, and how would you set up your trade, uh, you know, going through with that in the lineup? I mean, to me, I've talked about this before. You know, I look at Landis Cog, I, I say you throw out Botnin, you throw out some prospects or draft picks, you try to make that deal. Uh, like we mentioned before, JVR's out there. You mentioned uh, Tyler Johnson too from Tampa Bay. That's another name out there. I mean, I think that's what the Ducks have to do. I mean, in order for the Ducks to make some kind of trade, let's let's, let's kind of clear the air on this. They have to move somebody that that it will clear up cap space. I mean, you've got Stoner. He's in the minors. He went on waivers. Nobody picked him up. No one's going to get him. You've got Dupre. He's injured too. And I know we've got some questions about updates on both those guys. They're both still out. I know Dupre has been at one of the Duck games recently, which is a good sign. But neither one of them has skated recently. So... They're still down and out, so they're really not options. So to me, and you and I talked about this, Eddie, in the last couple of podcasts, all signs point to Votnin. If you're going to set up one of these trades for one of these forwards and you're going to move a defenseman uh, you know, to get someone that's not a rental, that's really where the Ducks have to go. I, I mean, I don't know what else they're going to do. I mean, they can try – to move some more draft picks with a weak draft class next year to try to get another forward that's most likely going to be a rental with Patrick Eves. But I really don't know if uh, Murray wants to do that. We saw that with McGinn. We saw that with uh, – uh, we had Perron and Haglin in the trade you know, last season too. That didn't work out as well. You know, They all left. I mean, so I, you know, I, it's tough. But if the Ducks are going to make a move for a forward that's going to help this team – for now and in the future, uh, you and I talked about it. Uh, unfortunately, Votnin's the name that comes up the most right now. Yeah, and really, it's just the best option for them in a sense. If if you're going to improve this team, you know you've got the depth on defense. That's where the most likely the, the big piece is going to come from. You know, Lindholm is definitely not going to be the guy who gets moved. You know, then it's up in the air between Fowler and Votnin. But with the way Fowler's played this season, you know, more so maybe lean to keep him especially he's also uh, $875,000 cheaper on the cap hit so there's a possibility that that comes into factor as well and then you look at the expansion draft what we've talked about as well with Josh Manson and you know he's controllable you don't want to really lose him he, he's got another season only $825,000 you, you don't want to lose him to Vegas for nothing um, and if you're looking to get that top six forward, there's a lot of teams, especially teams that it makes sense to make a trade with, specifically Colorado and Tampa Bay, who are looking for that top four defenseman in Sammy Votnin, especially a puck mover too. And it just comes down to the two most likely options are Colorado and Tampa Bay. And, and to start with Colorado, it all depends on if they're really willing to make that deal right now for either Duchesne or Landis Cog, more so Landis Cog in, in, in the case for the Ducks. But this is a team who doesn't really have to make that deal. I mean, Landis Cog is signed for the next five seasons. There's no urgency for them to make the deal. I, I mean, they don't need to trade him right now. They're, they're going to get a top pick in the draft. They could just something they could wait and wait until they get the best deal. I think they would have to get blown away right now um, for them to really consider trading him. And if that means getting rid of either Sam Steele or Jakob Larson or Max Jones or Shea Theodore or Montour or any of those guys, I'm not sure I'm willing to give up more than he's really worth for a guy like Gabriel Landeskog. Uh, I mean, a lot of things have been rumored or that we've been talking about as possible deals in, in our in our Ducks and Pucks group is maybe like Vaughton and Larson in, in a first-round pick. And even that is a lot to give up and and yes Landis Cook is a very good player but you're paying a premium because you know Colorado doesn't have to make that trade right now so that's 
an option there, and I think the most likely option is Tampa Bay. I think it just it just kind of makes sense. They've shedded Bishop's salary cap. They're looking to shed Filpula's salary cap. You know, the, he's a guy that's been moving around. He's got five million on. There's going to be teams looking for him. He submitted apparently a 16-team list that he can get traded to. So that could be something where he gets traded tomorrow, and that frees up, like I said, up to $5 million for him if they don't bring any salary back. And then possibly that opens up a trade for where they can take on a little bit more salary in Fontenot's contract and move out a guy like Tyler Johnson and move out a guy like Andre Palat, who they won't be able to pay for in the offseason, and give the Ducks that top six floor they're looking for. I think if any big trade happens of the teams we've mentioned with tomorrow, I think it happens with Tampa Bay. Yeah, I, I think Tampa Bay is one to watch, you know, and uh, Eddie Richard asks about, you know, what other teams are, are you looking at besides the Ducks? Uh, I think you touched on it. I think Colorado, obviously, Atlanta Scogs name has been thrown out there. Uh, there were some reports today that they were going to kind of hold back on DeShane and maybe push Atlanta Scog back out there. So Colorado is one team to definitely watch. Uh, Toronto is another one. Obviously, the Ducks traded with Toronto a couple of times. JVR's name comes up again, just like last year. The trade deadline doesn't mean it's going to happen with the Ducks, but it may happen with someone else. Uh, another team that came up today was uh, Edmonton. People were talking about uh, Nugent Hopkins. They were talking about Emberley. Those are some other names. I don't think those are guys that would go with the Ducks just because it's in the division and the Ducks are so tight between San Jose and Edmonton for the top three spots. So I don't think that will happen with Anaheim. I mean, it doesn't mean that you know Edmonton won't make a move. They might make a move with some other team. But that's another one to watch. Uh, another team to watch, too, Eddie, is Arizona. Arizona has, you know, they're in the bottom again, unfortunately. Uh, Verbata's name came up again today. That's another one that may be out there. So there's some teams out there to look at, to watch between, you know, tonight and tomorrow that may make some moves. Yeah, I think, you know, as in making moves with the Ducks, those are definitely some teams to watch. One that came up today, which was pretty surprising, was the New York Islanders. They're looking to move out Yaroslav Halak because Thomas Grice has taken the number one spot in net for them, and they're looking to move him out, and there's a possibility that he gets traded before the deadline. Um, and the big news for them was they were looking uh, and pushing hard at getting uh, Matt Duchesne to come to the Islanders. So that, I think that would surprise a lot of people because, you know, we've heard the, the Senators mentioned, the Predators have been mentioned in Duchesne's name. You know, Montreal has been a big suitor for him. And the Islanders now coming into the picture. There's a lot of guys pushing to get uh, Matt Duchesne at the deadline. So that will be interesting to see if they do anything tomorrow. Uh, but, yeah, I think for us at least the, the big news will be focusing on if the Ducks can actually get a top six forward. And, and if it is, eventually, who who do we get? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that's the, the move. The Ducks go for defense to offense. Uh, you know, and some people, they, they touched upon the goalies too. Uh, we had uh, Ringo ask us about Ryan Miller and his chances of coming to the Ducks or one of the other te- California teams. And, and we'll talk about some of these trades. Obviously, uh, we would say no on the Kings because of the Bishop and, and Budai trade, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But as far as the Ducks, you and I talked about this. You know, Bernier is another name that does come up. Um, you know, you got $4 million there that you could clear off the cap, something that the Ducks could look to do. And, and, you know, with Enroth being as on fire as he has been for San Diego – um, the Ducks could realistically move out Bernier and bring in somebody and have Enroth be the backup to Gibson because you have to think if the Ducks are going to make a run in the playoffs, they have to ride Gibson. That, that's just the way it's going to be. So it really doesn't matter if the backup is Bernier or Enroth. Uh, you know, I'm not saying that they're going to make that kind of move, but if you're looking at the goalie situation, and you and I talked about this, we talked about moving out Botnin or trying to clear out cap space to get in an afford on defense, Bernier is another option. It's probably less likely of the two, but I wouldn't completely rule it out, Eddie. Yeah, I think it's possible if they're looking to move cap space. Um, you know, as for Ryan Miller uh, and the question that uh, he asked, I I don't think it doesn't really make sense for the Ducks. Like you said, Gibson is going to be our guy going into the playoffs, and you know it doesn't really matter if we have Miller, Bernier, and Roth to back him up if he gets hurt. It's not really a big upgrade to really take on that extra 2 million dollars of cap that Vancouver or that M- Miller has. He's a 6 million dollar cap hit. So, it's not really worth worth it especially when the Ducks only have two more back-to-backs um for before the end of the season. They've got Chicago and St. Louis on the 9th and 10th of March and then they've got Buffalo and San Jose 
on the 17th and 18th of March, and that's their only two back-to-backs for the rest of the season. So foreseeably, we could see if Gibson is healthy, he could play every other game that isn't those two back-to-backs if you know if the Ducks are feel comfortable with doing that. So it doesn't make sense uh, for Miller. Um, as for what you mentioned with Enroth and Bernier, if they, I think if they can move him and they believe in Enroth and, and they can get a, a you know a team to actually bite on that contract and you can save some money to make another deal, then I think they do it. Um, I don't think it's the most urgent thing for them right now. I don't think they're they're actively shopping Bernier, but I think if a team comes in or a situation arises that they can move him and save some cap, I, I don't see why they wouldn't if they believe enough in Enroth being the backup. Yeah, I agree 100%. I think it's, it's going to be a little bit more on the defense is what the Ducks are going to look at moving. And it's, you know, going to be for, you know, non-rental type players. I mean, that's that's just what Murray said, and that's kind of what we're looking at. And obviously we're down to the wire here, and hopefully they do something. Because right now the way the Ducks look is they're going to make the playoffs, but I just don't know how far they're going to go, Eddie. That's the concern. So I, I really think if the Ducks can make a move for a forward and pick up someone, you know, that's going to be the key. Um, you know, we got a lot of trades that uh, happened too recently uh, that we can kind of talk about here and how they kind of they kind of affect the Ducks too a little bit too because we've talked about Tampa Bay, we talked about Arizona, Edmonton, Colorado, all these teams. But, you know, the trade deadline is uh, obviously March 1st, but a whole lot of stuff happened the last couple of days, Eddie. And I think if we look at the first one, that was kind of interesting is you had the Kings in Tampa Bay making a trade, which I know our writer Phil was was upset because uh, Ben Bishop went to the Kings and Budai went to the Lightning along with some picks and uh, and whatnot. And I thought this was an interesting move. I talked to some people I know that that cover the Kings and whatnot. And, and basically in this trade, it, it's kind of interesting, Eddie, that they felt that Quick wasn't necessarily 100%. Or that there's a concern that maybe he re-hurts his groin or whatnot. So they felt the Kings' the position was between Budai and Bishop. They felt that if they had to go with one of those two instead of Quick, they felt Bishop would take them farther in the playoffs. The other side of that equation, too, is Eisenman felt like he was stuck in a hard place with Tampa Bay because nobody was really talking to him about Ben Bishop. So it's kind of an interesting move, but uh, you know, after you hear all that, it kind of makes sense. Yeah, it, it does make sense and and why it was and and Eisman said as well that it was it was the only offer that they got otherwise they would have had to keep Bishop at the end of the season which I, that actually surprised me because I thought uh, one Dallas would be in on it possibly but more so the Flames would be a team that would be in on Bishop I mean they're closer to the playoffs right now than the the Kings are and they've been rotating goalies all season and Brian Elliott who's actually been playing well for them lately uh, Chad Johnson. You know they've had a, a you know a carousel of goalies in and out of the Calgary lineup so far this season, and, and they've been in on Ben Bishop. You know in the rumors as early as last season. So I I guess maybe they think they can entice him in free agency and possibly bring him there, and that's why they didn't want to give up any assets. But I mean you look at what was exchanged. I mean well, Peter Budai, a decent defensive prospect in Eric Cernak, a seventh round pick in this year's draft, and a conditional pick was all that Tampa Bay really got. And then, obviously, the cap relief um, that they get from trading Ben Bishop's contract, which helps them out as well. But it's not a huge return, and it's something that you would have expected at least a couple more teams to be in on. But I think this was one of the most surprising deals, probably the most, even with Shatker going to Washington, that, that you know I didn't really think L.A. would be a, a contender for Ben Bishop. You, you know They've been rumored to be looking for a goal scorer, and the fact that now he's ended up there, it's a little bit surprising. Yeah, I agree. It's, it seems like the Kings are really all in, and and we've seen it before. You know, they've ended up being the seventh or eighth seed and have gone really deep. So, the Kings are a team that's definitely looking to make the playoffs. So I wouldn't count them out. I mean, obviously they're battling out with Calgary. Calgary's right behind the Ducks. Uh, you know, in the Pacific Division. So uh, Lombardi's throwing out the chips. You know, I mean, he he's pushing to go all in. So. Um, we'll see how the Kings pan out, see if they make any moves the next day. Uh, you know, another team that's going for it too, as you mentioned earlier, earlier in the podcast that it was Minnesota, uh, Minnesota got Martin Hansel from, uh, the coyotes and Ryan white in a draft pick. And they basically sent nothing back to Arizona. They sent a bunch of draft picks, uh, and, and forward downing, which is whatever. So the wild are trying to go in all, you know, too. And obviously with Boudreaux there, we know, you know, they played well in the regular season, 
Um, they're really, uh, you know, kicking butt and taking names in the Central Division during the regular season, mind you. But uh, the Wild are another team that are making a push for the playoffs. Yeah, and, and, you know, they've pretty much locked up the Central Division. Chicago's breathing down their necks, but, you know, they would take a collapse on the Wild to not win the Central, which means they'd probably play either Calgary, the Blues, or the Kings in that wild card spot, depending on who finishes in that second wild card spot. And, you know, you look at the condition on these picks, they get a first round pick in 2017, they get a second in 2018 in that conditional fourth, which goes up around every playoff round that the wild win. If they win one round, it becomes a third. If they win two, it becomes a second. And, and that's a lot. I mean, you look at what, uh, well, eventually we'll get to it, what the blues got for Shattenkirk. Uh, I mean, you know, this is a lot for Martin Hansel. And, and a lot of it came into, I saw a tweet that said, you know, Minnesota was trying to just keep the, him away from other Western Conference teams, which kind of goes into this, is they wanted him to make them better, but they also didn't want anybody else in their conference or specifically in their division, uh, i.e. Nashville most likely, uh, to get better. Um, so I think it was a, a good deal for them. I think it does make them better. I mean, he had two points for them tonight as well. Um, and Ryan White's a solid pickup for them as well. So I think it makes them a scarier team than they already were. Um, but like you said, it, it depends on how far they go. I mean, this is a good trade for them if they can go deep or win the cup. I mean, they're all in right now. But if not, that's a lot to give up for arguably a, a third-line center. Yeah, I agree 100%. And, and we'll have to see. You know, we know about Boudreaux and his playoff experience. So we'll see what happens in the central division. And like you said, who they match up against, whether it's a wild card team from the Pacific or a wild tar, uh, excuse me, a wild card team from the central, uh, another move that came up too. you know, we talked about Tampa Bay, you mentioned, uh, Philippa, you mentioned, uh, Tyler Johnson, some other players that the ducks might go after. But in this one, you have, uh, Tampa Bay sent, uh, Brian Boyle to the, uh, Toronto Maple Leafs. What did you think about this trade? I, I mean, you know, it wasn't really that big of a deal, but you know, they they sent Boyle, who's kind of been a staple in the, in the Tampa Bay team uh, for the last couple seasons. Yeah, and I think this is actually a really smart trade by uh, the the Leafs. I mean, it it is a 2017 second round pick. The draft this year isn't as deep as it will be next year, so it's not a huge thing to give up. And I think the main reason behind this is, you know, it's a very young team in Toronto. And there was a stat that came out the other day saying, you know, the guys who've played the most playoff games since 2012. And Boyle was second. He has 95 games. And the guy who's played the most was Haglin, who played 97 games. And you look at the teams that they've played, Boyle's played with specifically in the last you know, few seasons. He's played with the Rangers, and now he's played with Tampa Bay. I mean, they've all gone far, and he's been a key player, you know, defensively. On those teams, he's a huge guy, 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, I, I think he brings experience to that team, and he brings size, and, and I think it's a good deal for them if they're going to make the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, and it's going to be interesting. They're making a push right now, obviously, Anderson and Net for uh, Toronto, so they're trying to do what they can uh, to get one of those last spots. Uh, Tampa Bay has been struggling uh, surprisingly this year. We thought they were going to be a lot better, but they aren't. So we'll see what happens with that. You know, obviously we think in Tampa Bay may make some more moves. Obviously, like we talked about Bishop uh, going out too. So they're another team to watch as uh, the trade deadline wears down. Um, another move that came up too recently is uh, you had uh, Vancouver. They sent uh, Alex Burroughs, the finger biter. They sent him <laughs> to Ottawa, Eddie. And uh, the Ottawa sent uh, Jonathan Dolan to uh, Vancouver. I, I mean, I, I don't really think this was a big move, but I thought it was interesting, too, because they also uh, gave Burroughs an extension, too, in Ottawa. Yeah, um, this is a great deal for Vancouver. I mean, Burroughs, not that great of a player anymore. Uh, I mean, in the old NHL, he was a great player, physical guy, passed it, but you know he's not that quick. He doesn't score a lot of goals anymore. A weird trade for the Sens to make. I mean, they're a borderline playoff team this year. They're more of a younger team. And then they give away young Ford to bring in Burroughs and also sign him to a two-year extension. It, it was kind of a weird one. I mean, I don't want to harp on Burroughs and say he's a terrible player, but when you give up a, a decent prospect in return for only Alexander Burroughs and that's all you get, uh, I mean, I think it's a disappointing trade. A, a weird one. One I didn't really expect to see, especially, you know, there was rumors he'd get traded, but I didn't think it would be to the Senators. Yeah, I, I didn't understand this trade either. It was kind of interesting. I mean, I don't know. I guess the Senators thought maybe bringing in some older experience. I You know, I don't know. 
yeah, may, maybe they look into eat finger food. I don't know, but they brought in Burroughs. <laughs> so that's what that's what Ottawa looked to do on that one. So that one was kind of a weird one of these trades that we're talking about. And you know, the big the another bigger one though that came up here was Washington. Why, you know, the Shattenkirk sweepstakes ended up going to Washington D.C. with the Capitals. They picked him up. They sent forward uh, Sanford and Malone to St. Louis, some draft picks. Uh, and, you know, one of the fan questions was of the trades that had gone on, obviously, to this point in the show, Eddie, you know, who, who's the front runner or who's made the best deals. And obviously, you got to look towards Washington. Washington was already a contender in the Eastern Conference. They go against Shattenkirk because their defense isn't always the best. I mean, it's been better in years, but it's not always been the best. And now they do this. I mean, you really have to look at Washington as a team that's really going to push not only to make the playoffs, but to go deep this postseason. Well, I mean, they were already probably the favorites. Um, they're you know they're the best team in the NHL right now. They've been a very good, you know, arguably the best regular season team over the last few seasons. You know, they've got an All Star goaltender in Holtby, a franchise player in Ovechkin. They've got Backstrom, Kuznetsov. Their forward line just set. They've got a pretty solid defense with you know, Orpik and Carlson and the guys that they have back there. And then you bring a guy like Shattenkirk. I mean, it kind of came out of nowhere, to be honest. He was rumored to go to New York. You know, that's where he's from. They seem to be the front runners. They've now seemed to move to go get him in free agency, and that's probably where he'll land in free agency. So New York saved them uh, some picks, which they don't really have. But, you know, kudos to Washington for going out and just making themselves that much better. They didn't really have to. I mean, they're the best team in the NHL, but... Just like Minnesota, you know, these are the two top teams in the league, and they made the two biggest splashes so far, but you know, w- before the trade deadline. So, I mean, I don't think there's much more unless Duchesne or Landeskog uh, get moved that can top this trade, uh, and it makes a scary Washington team even scary. I mean, he jumps right up to most likely their best defenseman, especially their best offensive defenseman. Um, and for what they had to give up, I mean, it's not it's not too bad for the Capitals. I mean, there's no surprise that they're all in again this season. And you only give up a first-round pick in 2017, a conditional second-round pick in 2019, uh, a solid uh, prospect in Zachary Sanford, and then a, a AHL guy in Brad Malone. It's not a huge, you know, deal to give up, and they only uh, took on a, you know a little bit in salary because St. Louis retained 39 percent of it. So I, this is a huge deal for them and, and a, sort of a surprising one that Washington was really in on them. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, so far to this point, I mean, like you said, it's Minnesota and Washington that are ones that have you know made the big moves, and then obviously uh, I'd probably say behind that maybe the Kings. You know, they're trying to obviously get into that wild card spot bringing in Bishop, you know, uh, with, uh, you know, uh, Budai going out. So those are kind of the moves that have happened so far. Obviously, we're on the eve of the trade deadline. There, there could be more stuff going on. Uh, you know, going back to the Ducks here, um, I, I really hope they do something, Eddie. You know, last year we, we went live on, on uh, Blab, which is gone. We're going to uh, do a Facebook Live uh, thing tomorrow at 10 uh, on uh, facebook.com slash Ducks and Pucks. Eddie and I will be on there. We'll be talking about all kinds of things that have happened, uh, obviously, with uh, you know the couple days before the trade deadline, and hopefully there'll be some news um, you know, r- you know, right after this podcast. But um, it's going to be interesting. I, I really uh, hope the Ducks do something. I hope they don't wait till the, uh, you know, the final hour, basically, which is what we saw last year when the Ducks – Looked like they were going to do nothing. Then they had all these trades come in at the last minute. Um, I, I don't like the Ducks waiting until the last minute because it seems like you know you're you know you're kind of going more for the rental type thing, which Murray said he doesn't want to do if he's going to move out a defenseman. So I, I'm hoping the Ducks pick up somebody uh, to add to the offense. Uh, I really hope that they don't give up a Theodore or a Montour because that's not going to help the uh, the cap situation. And if they're going to pick up someone that's going to help the team for the next couple of years, but um, we'll be back tomorrow for sure. We're going to do that, um, you know, on the Facebook page. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, anything you guys want to talk about, any kind of questions you guys have. I, I did a kind of a test run uh, before, which was good. I had a lot of people on there, and we were talking about the Ducks and, and and all kinds of random questions you guys asked us, which were hilarious. So we'll do that tomorrow. Uh, what are your th- final thoughts, Eddie, as far as uh, the trade deadline with you know the Ducks heading into this with uh, you know less than 24 hours ago? 
I mean, I don't think tomorrow that they go out and get another rental. It just doesn't make sense. I mean, Eve's made sense because he's cheap. Um, probably the best, cheapest option that you could have got. Um, I, I, and I, I'm glad that they got it done with, you know, early. Um, but if they do anything tomorrow, I think it is a pretty big deal. If anything gets done, I mean, it has to be a deal for a top six forward, or maybe we see a guy get moved out to save cap. But then again, why would you make a deal like that? You know, if say a BX or a Bernier or somebody gets moved out to save cap, you know, you wouldn't do that if that was the only deal they'd be looking to make another move. So if anything happens small, I think it's a big deal and I hope it gets done, but you never know with Murray. Yeah, exactly. We've seen him do all kinds of wacky things. So stay tuned. Like I said, uh, check out Facebook tomorrow in the morning. We will uh, be on there. We'll be talking about all kinds of different things. Uh, thanks for listening to the podcast. Also, we're going to have some watch parties in March. We're going to have one on March 9th and March 30th at El Ranchito in Orange. So look for those. There, We are going to have a few more of those. I know we didn't do as many this year, but we're going to do a couple more. Uh, I'll post different things uh, you know, in the next couple of weeks reminding you guys about that. And also go to uh, you know tnphockey.com. We have a lot of the shirts on there. I know uh, you guys bought a lot actually in the last uh, week or two. Uh, a lot of stuff's discount on sale. I'm trying to clear out a bunch of stuff, so check that out as well. And uh, let's just hope that the Ducks do something big and make a big, uh, strong push for the playoffs. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Let's go, Ducks.